Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Finding Hope with Overcoming a Mess webinar series for this very exciting and very popular session uh, with Dr. Stephen Simpson Yap from the Neuroepidemiology Unit and Dr. Jonathan White, which is on diet. What the evidence tells us. My name is Liz Waters, and I'm the Community Engagement Program Manager. Joining you from the middle of the UK, very cold here. Um, in a moment, I shall be welcoming Steve and Johnny to the stage. Um, but before I do that, I just want to run through a little bit of housekeeping for you just to help keep the session running nice and smoothly. Um, so just to note that the session is being recorded, so you will receive a link to this recording in a couple of days time. You'll also note that because it's a Zoom webinar, there's no audio or video component uh, for participants, but there is a Q&A. Um, tab and we really do encourage you to get involved and post your questions. Um, if you're experiencing any technical glitches, please do try leaving the webinar and re-entering using the link that you were sent in your email. Um, and for best results, we do recommend that you use a Chrome browser. That seems to work best for our webinars today. Um, we've also tried to make the session interactive. You can use um, subtitles, so you've got a closed captioning uh, transcript button at the bottom of your screen um, so you can show subtitles or hide subtitles whichever suits you best um, and as you exit the webinar there will be a short survey that pops up automatically and we really do welcome your feedback on this every bit of feedback that you give us we do listen to and we um, improve our services accordingly um, the webinar today will run for approximately an hour and just to manage your expectations, we have received a really large volume of questions today, um, some of which are around how the diet sits with the program. So just again, to manage your expectations, today's session will specifically address the research around diet and MS. Um, and Johnny will be feeding those more specific questions um, to Steve. So I hope that's OK with everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us again. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Steve and Johnny to the virtual stage. Thank you very much, Liz. Hello, um, guys. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks. And you? Good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, so obviously, we've got a really jam packed session, lots to get through. So I won't keep you any longer. But just thank you so much for giving us your time today um, and enjoy the session. Thanks, thank you, Liz. And um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on what is a very cold and snowy morning in Northern Ireland. Looks a little bit better in Melbourne where Steve is, but um, over here, not, not so nice. Um, I'm really, really honored, privileged, and really grateful, Steve, that you're able to join us today. It's a, it's a great uh, area of excitement for me to be able to talk to somebody about diet and MS, and also to do a webinar where I don't have to do all the work for a change, which is great, and I'm sure the audience will appreciate it too. So I just want to introduce you formally to, to, our, to our audience. So Steve Simpson Yap is a Senior Research Fellow at the Neuroepidemiology Unit at the University of Melbourne. Many of you will have heard of that unit. It was founded by Professor George Jelinek, who some of you might know. Um, Steve is originally from Indiana in the United States, and he undertook his graduate training in Hunter College. Uh, his postgraduate training was at the University of uh, California, Berkeley, and then he moved to Australia, uh, where he, and Tasmania specifically, where he did a postdoc in um, the Menzies Institute in Tasmania. His current work is an, as an epidemiologist, and specifically examining the connections between lifestyle, diet, uh, and autoimmune conditions, but specifically at the moment, we're very grateful multiple sclerosis. So Steve, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. And I'm really excited to hear what you have to tell us. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Wonderful. I'll just share my screen if I may. Um, all righty, Rue. And can you see that? Uh, no, yes. Wonderful. There we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, you guys have seen the title. Uh, I'm presenting today about diet and MS, uh, what the evidence tells us, but particularly I'm going to kind of give you guys a little bit of a primer about what it is that goes into a study of diet and may give you uh, a, a, an idea of why it is, I say it the, uh, repeatedly actually, uh, that there is not enough studies in diet uh, in MS. So uh, who am I and what do I do? Uh, as, uh, as John and Sam said, uh, Sean said, I'm an epidemiologist. And what an epidemiologist does is uh, we take uh, data sets of demographic, clinical, and lifestyle, and some other things like genetic and MRI and other things, and we apply statistical analyses to try to assess the relationships with a goal of finding what causes what. Uh, so I want my work 
uh, to help our understanding of the factors both modifiable, like diet, and otherwise, like for instance, uh, your genotype or uh, your uh, just uh, clinical history and so on, that affect human health and disease. Uh, I'm not a clinician, however. Uh, there are a lot of doctors uh, that do epidemiology research, so clinicians that do epi research, uh, but I'm not a clinician, and so unfortunately I can't give you any guidance uh, about your particular conditions or give you advice about what you should do to make your health better. Uh, and in all those instances, I would uh, really counsel you to chat with your neurologist or your general practitioner uh, uh, if you're interested in modifying your diet, for instance, or uh, taking supplements or anything like that to try to improve your disease. Talk with your doctor. They can give you guidance about what's the best way you could do that in a way that is safe for you. Uh, but uh, even though I'm not a clinician, uh, I'm not right at the front lines of applying my work. It is my hope that the work I do do uh, will lead to information that your clinicians can use and help guide their treatment decisions in positive ways. And really, of course, it's my, my fervent hope uh, uh, that the work I do will lead to a cure for MS or at the very least a treatment for MS. Uh, and I believe that a lot of the work that we do, and I'll touch on a little bit here, um, does show, for instance, uh, ways that diet or uh, supplement use or stress reduction or things like that, the modifiable programs, uh, uh, lifestyle factors that are in the OMS and other lifestyle modification programs, they might end up being a component of clinical care once the evidence is there. Uh, and so, as I said, I want to present today about the diet or search in MS, including a little bit about the work that we've done and particularly what I want to do in the future. So just an outline of the talk, I'm going to touch on the background of diet and MS, uh, how we study in MS, a very brief bit, uh, there used to be a lot more in this talk, but I cut it back about what are some of the kindest studies and the findings they've done about diet and MS. I'm going to go in particularly then about one analysis method, which I think is an up and comer and one that is really powerful called index analysis. I'm going to describe how we're going to do a really amazing study using the UK MS register to better assess diet's relationship in MS, and then I'll just conclude. So why do we study diet in MS? Does it even matter? Uh, well, I believe that there is relevance for diet in MS. There's significant what we call biological plausibility, which is like if I told you, for instance, that your shoe size may affect the number of lesions on your MRI, you'd be well, that doesn't sound like there's any reason to that. But there's a lot of reason to think that diet may actually affect your disease. So it can obviously, as you might think, affect your body mass index, how heavy you are, uh, and affect that because that's been associated with MS. It can modulate fat and vitamin levels in the blood. Uh, which can, those have each been affected, uh, associated with MS. Uh, they can affect, which is really interesting, the microbes in your gut because they've been found that those microbes which help you digest food and so on actually kind of talk to your immune system across the gut-associated lymphoid tissue or the gut. Uh, and so it's possible that if you have food that kills off, uh, or rather a diet, I should say, that kills off some good microbes in your gut and they get replaced by unhealthy microbes, that could potentially lead to a more inflammatory state which could be worse for your disease. And there are other pathways, that, a lot of potential pathways by which diet can affect disease. Uh, and also, just frankly, diet co-varies with other behaviors and environmental exposures which have been associated with MS. So things like smoking, physical activity, uh, supplement use, it's like with like. People that have a good diet are potentially more likely to have better physical activity, to take more supplements, to not smoke. All of these things could comprise a healthy lifestyle, uh, a set of behaviors which can positively affect their disease. Uh, and so accordingly, there's strong potential for diet-based intervention to improve uh, MS risk and modulate the disease course. And multiple studies have been done uh, which suggest a role for diet quality affecting MS risk and MS progression. However, as I'll touch on, aspects of these studies, including the ones that we've done, so I'm not just saying our studies are amazing and everybody else sucks. No, unfortunately, diet studies are hard, and I'll go into that, uh, but these studies are lacking in, in various respects, including study design, so uh, basically how the study is implemented, the number of participants they include, so they don't include enough people, you can't actually find a, a valid association, how long those participants are followed over time, because you can't just measure somebody at one point in time and derive a causal interpretation. All that tells you is that diet is associated with your outcome, but you don't know a better diet leads to healthier outcomes. Uh, and then of course, how diet is measured, which I'll go into a lot here. And then also what and how clinical measures are, are actually measured. Uh, because if you don't have a good measure of the outcome and then you don't find an association, it's potentially because your outcome wasn't good.
Um, so diet programs, uh, my modification programs have been proposed for people with MS. As you'd be well aware, you're familiar with the Overcoming MS program. Uh, due to prom promising evidence from the observational studies that I'll touch on and the affirmation biological plausibility, there's actually been a number of diet programs that are proposed uh, that may benefit people with MS. Uh, so these programs are idiosyncratic and varied and importantly, uh, they're not complementary per se. Uh, some of them actually are quite distinct. For instance, the Overcoming MS program recommends uh, no land animal protein, uh, no meat, no dairy, uh, lots of seafood. Uh, but the McDougal program, for instance, recommends no seafood at all. It's all entirely plant-based. So those can't both be right. And then, for instance, the Terry Walls elimination diet actually goes hard the other way. It says, eat as much meat as you want. Lots of meat, lots of meat. You eat like a hunter-gatherer did back in the caveman days. But don't have things, for instance, like uh, uh, anything you get out of an orchard or, or, or out of a farm uh, here. So things like... Uh, 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 apples, pears, uh, potatoes, anything that you would grow on the farm, you can't touch that. So Overcoming MS says that's safe. Wall says that is not safe. Uh, and so that's that conflict. And so I believe, uh, and this just gives you a kind of uh, a breakdown, you can see a lot of conflict in here. So the Ashton MB Best Bet has some alignments with things, but you can see a lot of crosses where other diets have those tick marks. And so they can't all be right. And so there's the potential that having a healthy diet may benefit your disease, but it's important that the evidence be solidly there. Uh, and George would say this, George Jelinek would say this too, it's important that the diet uh, uh, program that you propose for people has the evidence underlying it, and some of the work that we're doing uh, has aligned with some of that. Uh, in addition to the diet programs that people have put forward as saying this may benefit your MS, there are other diet programs out there, for instance, ones you've heard of like the Mediterranean diet or low-fat, low-carb, the ketogenic, vegetarian and vegan diet, diets, and the intermittent fasting. Uh, these diets uh, have been found that potentially may improve your heart health, uh, may help your health in general, for instance, the Mediterranean diet. And so people with MS attempt to either follow these diets or they take little bits of these diets. They're like, well, if these diets are all healthy, then some parts of it must be good. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a potential that you put all the energy into following and changing your diet to follow the Mediterranean or the Walls diet, for instance. And if the evidence isn't there, you may be uh, investing your effort uh, uh, inappropriately. And so, uh, nonetheless, diet modification NMS is very common. So there's a large study in the United States that assessed to over 7,000 people with MS, and they found that almost half, 41%, reported following some diet programs. Uh, and a large proportion of those are following it to improve their MS. So that's what the, the first number is the number following a diet, and the number in brackets is the proportion uh, of those following it to improve their MS. So you can see not large numbers, but you can see the people following the car, low carb, Mediterranean, Paleolithic, especially large proportions were following it to improve their MS, even though the evidence is not quite there yet. In our own study, the Holosum study, which I'll show you some of the results for, uh, again, almost half of the participants reported following a specific diet for their MS. We asked them specifically, unlike the, the US study, we said, do you follow a diet to help your MS? Almost half said, yes, I do. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, a large proportion of those said they were following the overcoming MS, but even still, people reported following the Terry Walls or the Swank diet, uh, and then a handful of other ones you can see here. And what these results show is that people with MS are motivated. They want to take charge. They want to take action that's going to help their disease and not just wait on, you know, taking the drug, whatever the neurologist tells them. And they want to improve their health. However, it's important to ensure that they are making the right health behavior changes. And there's some that there's pretty uh, foolproof. You know, you could go and quit smoking. If you're a smoker, quit smoking. <laughs> Their evidence is so solid for that, that that is unchallengeable. That will help your lung health and your general health, but there's also some strong, compelling evidence uh, that it will improve their MS. Uh, but uh, there's other evidence that can really only come from solid epidemiological studies like those that I'm going to propose in here. Uh, and so some of you that know a little bit about epidemiology may say, well, geez, why don't you just go do a clinical trial? That's what they do with a drug. They get a drug out of the laboratory and they give it to a bunch of people. Some people get a sugar pill, some people get the actual drug, and they see if it works. Uh, and there's indeed a strong desire to undertake such trials to assess whether diet affects MS. Uh, and some studies, like for instance Terry Walls' diet, have been assessed in clinical trials, little ones. However, I say this skips a critical step in ascertaining 
whether you should bother getting to the clinical trial stage, whether diets actually associate with the outcomes. And that actually comes from observational study data, which is what we do uh, in the NEU. Uh, for instance, uh, is diet associated with MS and clinical progression? Well, what kind of diet? Does it uh, just have to be a healthy diet in general? Does it have to be a diet that excludes all dairy or excludes all meat? Or do you follow like the Terry Wells diet and have lots of meat but no apples and pears? Uh, uh, and once you find out what kind of diet, what does diet affect? You can invest millions of dollars to randomize and follow people for five or ten years uh, because you're looking at, say, fatigue. And, well, we can tell from observational studies that actually the evidence about diet and fatigue says there may not be something there. So maybe you're wasting time doing clinical trial for that. And instead, you should really focus on what we actually show, which is actually disability in our observational studies seems to. So disability progression by EDSS or so on. Uh, that may actually be worth your time. So it's important, though, to do these observational studies to inform the clinical trial development so that you can actually do the right diet, with the right exposure in the right population, because there's also the potential that it may only be beneficial in subgroups of people with MS. So you want to uh, know that information. Uh, and the other important thing, though, is once you've found out what kind of diet you want to do, what clinical, tr uh, what outcome you want to do, uh, it's not as simple as just pill A and pill B. Diet clinical trials are very complicated, much more complicated than a pill. I wish there was a way I could just give everybody in clinical trial a pill and I say this has all the food and nutrition you need on it, you just take this every morning and then I can count up how many pills they take and I know exactly what they've been eating because they've only been eating my pill. Unfortunately, our diet is not like that. This isn't the Jetsons yet. Um, uh, you have to actually measure their diet and measuring diet is hard. It's also in, very difficult if you say somebody with a, that's in a clinical trial, you need to follow only this diet. It's hard. I mean, I've seen, I've gone to, to restaurants with George and he has to follow a, a, a diet that follows the overcoming MS. And sometimes the restaurant doesn't have something on the menu that aligns with that, or it only kind of doesn't. So he ends up being able to be able to have a salad or something. Uh, he can't actually have something maybe that he wants. Uh, and it's hard to do that. And some people on a clinical trial might say, oh, well, they don't have it. So I guess I'll just have a burger because that's all they have on the menu. And that would really mess up our ability if they're on the intervention. It really messes up our ability to actually see uh, if the diet that we've allocated them to actually works. And so that's why it's very hard. And so what I say, it's very important to first uh, obtain the necessary evidence from observational studies, uh, as I said, to inform what kind of diet and what kind of outcome. And then once you do it, it's really uh, uh, doing clinical trial is possible, but it's a lot harder than a drug trial. Um, so NMS uh, in other conditions, how do we assess diet? Uh, well, let's say uh, we're all, I, I kind of wish I could see you. I very much wish I could see you because then we could all work on this together. We are going to do a study that tries to figure out uh, whether diets associated with MS. All right, so how are we going to do that? Well, first, do we need to measure diet in our study at all? What's our research question? What do we want to find out? If we're doing a study about physical activity, for instance, we probably need some measurement of diet. But if we're doing a study, say, of uh, blood levels of exposure to viruses, then maybe you don't need to measure diet. Because again, diet is complicated. In order to get an adequate measure, as I'll show you, you have to give them a lot of questions. And uh, that can be overwhelming and tires, tiring for people that are doing your study. So you ideally want to make your questionnaire as short as possible. So let's say, we do we need to measure diet? Well, we believe, yes, we do. So next question, what kind of study design do we need to implement? So really, I mean, there's a little more complicated than this, but it really boils down to cross-sectional studies and longitudinal or prospective studies. A cross-sectional study just measures your exposure and your outcome at one point in time. And there have been a lot of these because they're relatively easy to do. You can just recruit 100 people in your clinic and ask them, you know, what are their lifestyle behaviors, and then you look at their clinical records and you know what their level of disability is, and you can say, based on this, we find the exposure is associated with less disability, which is all well and good, but you don't know if, is, is it because the better exposure causes them to have a better outcome, or is it because the people that have a better outcome, less disability, whatever, they're able, they got more bandwidth, more energy to follow some healthier lifestyle. And so you could find what we call reverse causality, where it's actually the outcome causing the exposure rather than what you really hope for, which is your exposure is causing your outcome. And the way you can better assess this is doing a longitudinal study where you measure exposures and outcomes over time. Ideally, you get your exposure at time point one, 
and then you follow them for some amount of time, uh, six months or two years, or as we've done in Holosome, now seven and a half years, and you can say what they were doing at baseline, is it associated with their outcome way later? Because if you do, there's a better chance you can conclude that this actually means the exposure caused the outcome. It's much less likely if you, if you go over a long enough time frame that you're still seeing that reverse causality. So that was, is what we need to think of when we do an observational study in terms of design. Uh, in terms of once you figure that out, you really need to figure out logistical considerations. And these inform what approaches and measures you might take to assess diet. So how many people are you going to recruit? For that, we actually do a thing called power calculations, st st statistical power, there we go, uh, that says how many people you actually need to find the statistical association. Uh, how are you going to follow them and interview them? Are you going to do, do it on the internet? Are you going to call them up on the phone? Are you going to bring them into the clinic? Are you going to go to their house? Uh, there are different modes of this that cost more, obviously, if you send your people out to uh, where they live, uh, or it's potentially more burdensome on your participants if you ask them to come to the clinic. But then, uh, you know, that affects the quality of the data you may get. And then also, as I said before, do you need to do it as a single time point or multiple measures over time? And if it is multiple measures, how many measures? These are all things that go into it when the doctors and scientists are putting together these studies. Uh, it'd be, you know, and these, it's, it's complicated. Is what I go into. And then finally, if you've figured out all the design of your study and how many people you need and how many, how long you're going to follow them, how are you actually going to measure diet? Um, uh, well, it kind of depends on how comprehensive the rest of your questionnaire. If you're doing a study like Holosum, if, if any of you are participants in Holosum, you may know that diet is one part of a much larger questionnaire because we wanted to assess a lot of other factors. That gives us a lot of ability to then control for those other factors, but it then sometimes means that you have a very long questionnaire that not every participant with MS or with any participant full stop uh, is going to want to sit and complete all the way through the end. Sometimes we can link with other data sources, so instance, uh, their medical records, to reduce what we need to ask the participant because then we can get information about, say, what medications they're on, what kind of MS they have, and so on. From there, then we don't need to bother, you know, adding that to the questionnaire. Uh, also, if you can, if you can get bloods or other biological measures, uh, this can really help substantiate the findings that you might find with the diet exposure uh, uh, and its association with outcomes. So if I uh, ask you what kind of foods you're taking, uh, what foods you're eating, and then I take your blood, I can measure uh, what vitamins you have, what your lipid levels, so, you know, your cholesterol and other things. And then if I find a beneficial association with diet, I can help substantiate that by seeing, oh, it's actually cholesterol is also associated in the same way. And you can also potentially look to what extent uh, cholesterol or other factors is acting to mediate the association that you see with diet. And then finally, how detailed a measure of diet do you need? Sometimes uh, you can have a fairly superficial measure. There are short, short surveys of diet that are only five questions long. Sometimes you can simply ask them a very basic proxy question, how many serves of fruit and vegetable they have each day. And generally, people that have more fruits and vegetable serves are probably have a better diet in general. Or do you need a more detailed and comprehensive measure of diet intake? If you do, there are various measures out there. So there are questionnaires, uh, and you've got to balance uh, the length and the detail you want to get versus really what a participant is willing to sit through. Because if I could ask a participant about every single thing that they've eaten in the last year, I would love to have data. I would love to have that data to work with. Unfortunately, I'd probably get like two people that would give me every single food that they've eaten in the last year. And hopefully, uh, we never have to ask them that level of detail. We can use a survey like this, which asks, uh, uh, it's, it says they're kind of in, on average in the last year, but sometimes they ask them the last week as kind of a proxy for their lifestyle over the last year. And so it asks them about individual foods and says, you know, how, how often you had it, never or less than once a month, all the way up to six or more times a day. And you ask them about uh, different serves of different, uh, either fruit in general or individual fruits like this one, strawberry, raspberry, and kiwi fruit. Uh, you ask them about the good foods like that. You ask them about the bad foods like chips and, and pizza. And with that, you can get a lot of data. But again, it's a matter of what the participant is able to put through. If you've already asked them a lot of questions in other parts of the survey, and then you give them a book of a diet questionnaire, you may not get as many people actually answering all the questions, and that's problematic. Uh, for, for us, problematic, not problematic for the, for the participant, problematic for us because it means the data, unfortunately, wouldn't be as, as well as what we can use. Another way that we can test diet is called food diary. 
Uh, this is more comprehensive, but it's uh, basically literally asking about every single food that they, uh, food and beverage they had uh, in the last couple of weekdays and the last weekend days. So you generally try to get three days, a couple of weekdays, one weekend day. Uh, and then the problem is that it's very idiosyncratic. It requires a lot of processing as opposed to that questionnaire, which is just one size fits all for everybody. So it requires a lot of processing, but it is good for a lot of detail you can get. Uh, and then the best way really uh, uh, is weighing their food intake. And this is uh, if you could actually take your participants and put them uh, in a laboratory and just follow them and make them live there and follow them over time, you would measure every single bit of food that they had. But as you can imagine, we're never going to do that. Nobody's going to come in and do that. And it's also unethical. It's a significant burden on the participant and it would be a data that we really could not use. So uh, the ideal measure when we do diet and really any exposure is we want to get it as close in time uh, to the actual exposure as possible because there's issues of recall bias and, and error. So if I asked you what you ate yesterday, a lot of you probably be able to give me a pretty re reasonable answer. But if I asked you what you're eating this time last year, I mean, kind of guess, but you're not really going to know. And there's also an issue of bias, which is to say somebody who's really motivated to care about their lifestyle may actually keep a record of this or may just really be switched on or remember their lifestyle in a way that if I was recruiting some, you know, uh, control, uh, just, you know, random healthy person off the street and ask them what they ate a year ago, they'd probably look at me like I was an idiot. They wouldn't know. Uh, but that difference between your cases and your controls is something you have to consider when you're doing a study like this. Um, uh, and as I'm saying here, so short-term recall is the best, uh, but again, it's good to get serial measures over time. But it's all these are all the considerations that go into it. Um, uh, and, and I already said this about getting related measures to substantiate. And so the conclusion of all this is diet studies are complicated. It's hard to get accurate and sufficiently detailed information about diet from your participants, particularly if you then ask them to come in every year or every couple of years, over multiple years of a study, because that's what you really need in order to get that level of detail. Uh, and when we do studies like this, we have to balance the optimal ideal uh, of what detail we'd love to get from our participants and what they are willing and able to give us without getting so overwhelmed and tired that they either come in once and then we never see them again, or they just get halfway through the questionnaire and say, oh, no, this is too much and then we don't get that data. Whereas if we've taken the time to try to get a shorter questionnaire that is actually able for them to complete it reasonably, we'll get as good a data as we can get, uh, but uh, not so much that we don't actually get a valid sample of our participants. Uh, even still, uh, a number of studies have been done to assess diets relationships uh, with clinical outcomes, and I'm gonna summarize those a bit now. Uh, so one of the basic ones was uh, done by uh, Swank, Ron uh, Swank uh, in Norway back in the 1950s, where you've actually looked at the frequencies of MS inland and on the coast and found that there were significant differences in the diet behavior between inland and on the coast, which suggested uh, diet may be related to MS. Uh, there have been some studies looking at individual foods and nutrients. So a study here in Australia compared people with MS and controls and then found that overall diet uh, dairy was not associated with case status, but particularly yogurt intake was associated with 11% less disease risk. And then another study by the same group assessed diet and found that while well, processed red meat uh, was not associated with case status, unprocessed red meat uh, was actually associated with less disease risk, uh, particularly among females. So these are uh, tantalizing, but importantly, these studies are only cross-sectional. They only measure these people at one time point, which means we can't derive causal conclusions about what, whether yogurt or unprocessed red meat may be something that we want to recommend to our people, or if it's actually just reverse causality. And several studies uh, have been published using their own data set, the Hullison International Perspective Study, uh, which we showed that diet was prospectively associated uh, with disability. Uh, so both cross-sectionally, where we measure them at one point in time, but importantly, prospectively, where we queried their diet at one time point and then assessed it with subsequent change in here with disability. And we can see this is a lovely uh, kind of plot that I hope to see, where you see that higher diet quality on the x-axis is associated with less disability on the y-axis. Uh, and indeed, we found that those in the top two levels of diet quality had uh, 0.3 points less disability accrual. And those same people also had 41, 36% less risk of increasing their disability over time. Uh, and then when we, that was the, up to the 2.5 year time point. 
when we continue that up to the most recent 7.5 year time point, we, you can see this figure looks very similar to the one I just showed you, and that's exactly the kind of thing we hope for when you have you study that kind of internal consistency. And now we're showing that those people that are at the top levels of diet quality have less disability progression and also almost half less risk of increasing disability over the 7.5 years. Uh, we've also assessed, in addition to disability, we've looked at other outcomes, including fatigue, depression, and quality of life. As I said earlier, fatigue, uh, we haven't actually shown a prospective association, which may suggest that you may not want to invest in that, uh, uh, at least based on the evidence so far, uh, if you wanted to design a clinical trial. But looking at quality of life, we found that uh, diet quality is associated with better quality of life. So you can see this figure is kind of the opposite, it's the opposite direction. So those people at the higher levels of diet quality have higher quality of life, whereas those people down here actually have decreasing quality of life. So you're guessing actually those people that are in the lower quality have roughly 0.5 points less disability, uh, less uh, physical and mental quality of life over time. Uh, and so my conclusions, uh, just from the, I, I just touched on the diet uh, studies have been done, their needs uh, yet exist for high quality evidence. Uh, so a number of studies have been conducted assessing diets association with MS risk, with disability progression, with quality of life. But these studies are lacking. They're often very small, which uh, uh, in terms of the number of people, they're often only cross-sectional, so measured at one point in time, which means you can't infer a causal conclusion. Uh, they're also followed for relatively short times, often only up to one or two years, whereas if you're looking at an outcome like disability, you really need five or ten years. Uh, and also, there's very heterogeneous modes of diet assessment. You can't ask, unfortunately, people about how many oranges they eat, uh, uh, because that's not really efficient, and it's also not really reflective of how we think diet's going to affect disease. It's not one factor, it's going to be a complex of, of all the factors you eat. And also, even the diet quality scores like we've used in Holosome just give an indication of uh, some predefined diet quality, but not necessarily about what the constituent elements may be or what kind of diet they should follow. It really just shows that healthy diet is potentially beneficial. And so I propose a holistic approach to diet, which is the index analysis method. Uh, so index analysis just sets a predefined schedule of some food or beverage intake. Uh, it may be, uh, sorry, a little out of order there. It may be just a general healthy diet, so kind of a model upon like the food pyramid. It may be a model upon some existing style of diet, like the Mediterranean diet. Uh, it may be based upon some research developed for the purpose. So, for instance, you may have heard the DASH diet for improving hypertension, or of course the overcoming MS, or the Terry Walls diet, which was proposed to benefit MS. Uh, it may be algorithmic, so there's something called the Dietary Inflammatory Index, which I won't touch on here, but basically gives you a score for how inflammatory your diet is. And given, as you know, MS is an inflammatory condition, that is very relevant. Uh, regardless of the index analysis method, though, it follows some schedule of foods, beverages, and nutrient intakes as per some protocol. Uh, and then you score people up based on what they're eating with basically how well their diet aligns with what the model diet is, Mediterranean diet, OMS diet, uh, anything. Um, so an example of this application is uh, my colleague Cindy Black assessed the Mediterranean diet in the Alzheimer's immune case control study, and they assessed that the Mediterranean diet, so the alternative Mediterranean diet index, found that a higher diet index score was associated with less disease risk, Although, as you can see here, it's not really dose dependent. These, it's just if you're in these top three categories, you have less disease risk. But unfortunately, if you remember what my figures showed, it was a lot more like a ladder of steps going down. That's really what you hope to see. Um, but there's very few studies. Uh, Cindy's here, uh, Cindy Black's study is one of less than four studies that have been done applying med uh, index analyses of any kind to MS risk. And unfortunately, all of them are cross-sectional in design, which means even if they do show a beautiful association between index, diet index, uh, and outcome, you don't know if it's actually causal. So what do I conclude from diet studies in MS? There's some promising results. Unfortunately, because they're often cross-sectional, it means we can't make causal conclusions. And there's relatively a lack of studies in general assessing diet's role in clinical progression. It's actually relatively easy to recruit a bunch of people with MS and a bunch of people that don't have MS and then compare them. But if you really want to know about disease progression, you need to follow people with MS over time, and that's harder to do. 
Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, they're usually small, short term, and there's few studies, if any, aside from our own wholesome study that assess outcomes like fatigue, mood, or quality of life. So what I'm proposing to do is use a beautiful study called the UK MS Register, which some of you may even be participants in. Uh, this is a national survey of people across England, Wales, and, and Scotland that has been following people with MS uh, since 2011. Uh, they actually recruited uh, over 10,000 people. Uh, it's got a core survey that people get sent in their email every six months, which queries their physical, uh, like clinical symptoms, their demographic characteristics, and a small number of lifestyle characteristics. But importantly, my colleague Shelley Coe, uh, who's based at Oxford Brookes University, uh, did a large diet questionnaire in 2015 and 16. And we had just done that, sur that same survey again just last month. And we've got another 3,000 people on top of the 2,200 people that they got in 2015. And this will allow us to do is we're going to be able to uh, assess diet quality in general. We're going to use those index analysis methods, which I showed you. So we're going to score people up on the Mediterranean diet. Uh, I'm going to try to score them up on the OMS diet, the Walls diet, all these other diets. And we're going to assess whether the evidence exists uh, for diet quality in these particular diets. Uh, to be associated with MS progression, and particularly what kinds of progression, because the UK MS Register has relapse, it has disability, it has fatigue, it has depression, it has anxiety, it has uh, uh, MRI parameters, it has quality of life, it has all these things which we can uh, inform so much about what diet, uh, uh, what kind of diet, and what does it affect. Uh, and yes, and importantly, we're going to have this follow up over 10 years, which is exactly the kind of long term duration that one has never been done for diet and MS. The longest it's been done is around Hollison's study with seven and a half years. But we're going to have this in a very large sample of potentially a couple thousand people, which gives us that statistical power that I said earlier that we need. Um, so concluding uh, uh, my talk here, and I've gone a little bit over time, my apologies, uh, there's promising evidence from existing studies, but they're lacking in sample size, follow-up, and design. There's opportunities for large-scale and comprehensive diet associations with the breadth of clinical outcomes in MS using our UK MS Register study, which will really enable us to give guidance about whether diet materially and consistently predicts clinical progression measures in MS. Um, and particularly, uh, you know, again, what kind of diet affecting what uh, outcome, which will give information for the clinical trials that we then need to do to really prove, uh, and that will then uh, potentially lead to its incorporation into practice. And it is my hope that the studies that we do will give guidance to people living with MS, whether and how diet can really predict their MS progression and how they can uh, uh, improve their diet to improve their life. Uh, so I want to acknowledge my colleagues in the neuroepidemiology unit, so Drs. Jeanette Reese and uh, Sandra Meet, who you have seen before, and Ms. Maggie Yu, our research assistant, and my colleagues in the UK, Shelley Coe, Thanasis Tectonitis, Richard Nicholas, and Rob Middleton. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Wow, I, I mean, it's complicated. <laughs> I just didn't yes. even know where to start. It, I think you've, you've just demonstrated remarkably eloquently just really how complex an area this is. And I think what it, what it actually, when you were, when I was listening to you and as you talked there, the first thing I was thinking was, does your average neurologist, doctor, GP, healthcare professional actually understand how difficult this research is? Do they know the difference between a prospective and a cohort study, a longitudinal study? And I would respectfully suggest, and I think I can say this because I am a doctor, they don't. So they, mm. they don't understand, they don't understand that there are levels of evidence and that you're never going to get to a, a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial and diet because as you very uh, well, you know, as you said very well, you, you can't give somebody a fake pill for their diet versus a real one. Mm. So, but because that doesn't exist, they just accept or they just, you know, quote this mantra that there's no evidence for anything. And that I think you've just shown is absolutely not the case. Um, to answer your question, so do, does, one, does the average doctor know about epidemiology? To some extent they do, uh, but as you say, uh, uh, they're looking in the top tier journals, which is usually where your drug trials get published uh, for their evidence. And they are, as you say, there are there's evidence, uh, there's a pyramid of evidence going from very basic like case series where you, you know, uh, one patient or a small number of patients and you look at their yeah. characteristics all the way up through the observational studies into a clinical trial. And 
it is my hope actually that we can get to a clinical trial for diet. It's just going to be a lot harder than you know pill A and pill B. Uh, but in terms of uh, why uh, a neurologist, um, for instance, doesn't recommend diet for MS, is they really they have a level of evidence that they feel they need to uh, uh, to reach in order to tell a patient that if you follow something, it will improve your disease. Uh, if they uh, have seen a high level clinical trial of a drug that's been done, they are fairly confident that if they then give that drug to their patient and say, this is based on the trial, it's going to reduce your relapse risk by half, or it's going to reduce the level of disability you accrue in the next few years, that that's true. Mm -hmm. And they don't believe, and uh, to some extent it's true, the evidence is not there for them to make that same uh, 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 claim to their patient. And as a clinician, you'd be well aware, you don't want to tell your patient something that you don't know or really are confident to believe is true. Because uh, mm -hmm. if you tell a patient, go follow this diet, it'll improve your disease, and then they go and they follow it to the letter, and then their disease gets worse, uh, they, don't, they don't trust that doctor anymore. And then they say, the doctor says, take this pill or take this uh, injection. Well, I don't know. You told me the, doc, uh, the do diet thing, and that didn't work, so why should I leave you about this? So that's why doctors are very cautious about recommending things. Uh, but it is my hope, again, that we can give them the evidence that they require, that they can maybe become more confident about recommending uh, diet and other lifestyle modifications. Of course, they could recommend a medication treatment that didn't work either. But I, I, I fully accept the point. Um, and I, what I would suggest is, you know, that when, when a doctor says, and I've heard this many times, there's no evidence for diet and MS. Well, I would politely say that, that there may not be evidence for a specific diet and MS yet, but I think that there is an increasing body of evidence that shows just how important diet quality is for people living mm. with MS. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, there's increasing evidence to suggest that a beneficial, that a healthy diet may have some beneficial health effects. But unfortunately, they don't necessarily know if that translates to MS, uh, whether it will reduce your disability progression or your relapse risk. Uh, I mean, there's some people that might say, well, just tell them to go take a healthy diet anyway. What's the worst it can do? Well, um, uh, one, as I got into earlier in this, what is a healthy diet? If you just try to go follow the diet that recommended for your heart health, then that's one thing. But if you're trying to follow a more idio a particular diet, an insular diet, uh, you may invest a lot of effort to exclude whole swaths of foods from your diet, and it may end up, the evidence shows that that's not necessary. Um, and also, again, particularly if somebody's biggest issue is their level of fatigue. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the doctor wants to be able to tell them that if you follow your diet, this diet will benefit your fatigue, but they want to be able to make sure that that's true. Because uh, if you lead a patient astray, then uh, it's bad for them. And, uh, and, and it's, frankly, it's hard for them to then potentially make other lifestyle improvements as well that may be beneficial. Thank you, Steve. Um, so we have some questions from our, our viewers out there in virtual land. And I'd like to pose a few of them if, if that would be OK. So the first one, our first one is that fruit and vegetables are, are so very often bracketed together in diet. But is there any evidence that, say, seven portions of fruit and no portions of vegetables is better or worse in terms of outcomes than say seven vegetables and no fruit. Does it like, can we, can we pull out that data from what we know so far? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Uh, happily, some of the de detailed data that we've got, like in the UKMS register I talked about, where we have that very detailed food questionnaire, which does actually query individual foods and beverages, uh, uh, potentially will be able to make those associations. Uh, uh, there's actually some colleagues I work with using uh, the Osmium Longitudinal Study, which is a, a multi-center longitudinal study here in Australia, uh, where they're looking at individual things like whole grain breads and, and individual things like that to try to ascertain to what extent these individual foods may be related. But as I went, uh, said earlier, it's unlikely that it's going to be any one food. Yeah. Uh, so to the question of should they just focus on fruit or f focus on vegetables, uh, I think I would fall back with just follow the balance. Uh, yeah. That it's uh, try to get a, a sampling of everything uh, in the hope that uh, uh, that you're getting the nutrients that come from all the different kinds of fruits and vegetables. I do. I do remember somebody saying once that it's not really the it's not five portions of fruit and vegetables a day, which is often quoted, but it's more the variety in the course of a week. And I know Tim Spector in the UK would always say thirty different plants a week, and probably eighty yeah. percent of that should be from vegetables. But I, but I, I think you're you're probably absolutely right. I don't think we can say one over the other so so definitively. Um, how many years of follow-up do you think, in your opinion, is the optimal to evidence a statistically significant result? And I, I presume that 
is to do with diet specifically. In, in, mm -hmm. Uh, well, I mean, it's for anything. I mean, when you're defining follow-up, you're really generally looking at the outcome, uh, and it depends. If you're looking at something that's relatively uh, chronic and progressive, like disability, as like I said, in the, in, you need five or ten years of follow-up to really s start to see a divergence in the level of disability. If somebody is you know, following a lifestyle or has other uh, characteristics that are going to make their disability accrue more than somebody with a healthier profile. You need time for those unhealthier people to accumulate the disability and it takes time. Uh, however, if you're looking at something like, for instance, quality of life or fatigue or depression uh, uh, or particularly relapse, uh, re you know, those exacerbations of the disease, you can have a much shorter amount of follow-up. Uh, unfortunately, as far as relapse is concerned, the really powerful disease-modifying therapies, those uh, immunomodulatory therapies, oh, sorry, immune modulating therapies, uh, have really knocked the relapse rate down to almost nothing. So we are, for instance, in uh, some of the studies we're developing, really focused on short-term outcomes like your quality of life, fatigue, and depression. Uh, so it depends. Uh, but ideally, if you could do a long-term study, a five or ten year follow-up study, you can still do those short-term outcomes earlier, even though you're really only looking at disability, for instance, in the longer term. Yep, thank you. Um, do you know are there any other registers that are similar to the UK MS uh, registry in, in other countries that are doing similar work? Is there is there a, a, an equivalent in other European study of countries, for example, or the US or Australia? Uh, there's one study here in Australia called the Australian MS Longitudinal Study. It's, it's delivers what's on the packaging, that one. Uh, but that one is a study they generally get about between 1,700 and 3,000 people that they do uh, annual surveys of. And they actually have done a survey of diet recently, which we're actually hoping to utilize as what we call an external replication. So basically, when we do our UK MS register study and we find an association between diet quality or some index of diet and some outcome, we want to then be able to replicate that in another setting, which we hope to do with the Australian MS Longitudinal Study. Uh, because they use a lot of the same measures. Uh, there's also a study in the U.S., the same one that I said uh, found over 7,000 people uh, and they were studying their, their lives, their diet behaviors. That's called the NARCOM study. Uh, the problem with the NARCOMs, unfortunately, is it's often only one-off, so they kind of do cross-sectional studies uh, rather than the longitudinal studies that we require. Uh, but in short, uh, not as many studies are the longitudinal studies that we require because, as I said, it's hard to recruit a bunch of people and follow them over time. But, but it would be really excellent, I suppose, if the UK MS register stuff comes out and it's backed up then by that in Australia, because that gives you that level of confidence that what Absolutely. you find isn't a gigantic one-off chance, but actually it's, it's happening in the real world for a, a provable exactly. reason. Yeah. And actually, the way we've designed this study in particular is it's got an internal validation step. So because it, it's perfectly plausible, uh, if you go out in large enough sample sizes, we'll have to find things by pure chance that actually there's no association at all. You just found a fluke in the data. But we've actually got an internal replication step. So we try to see if the association is real. And then we have that further external validation in the Australian sample, which hopefully if we do find a very strong signal that is validated across all those steps, it gives a much greater level of evidence that could potentially justify going right to a clinical trial. Fantastic. Um, so <clears throat> I have another one, Steve, that says, thank you for explaining all the different considerations that you need to take into account. Um, I responded to the UK MS registered diet questionnaire last month. Will we ever get to see what our own diet aligns most to? Uh, it might be a helpful tool for individuals. Yeah, that's something actually uh, I would love to do, uh, and I'll have to discuss it with the UKMS register people because once I can actually, you know, score up their diet questionnaire, or uh, for in the case of the index analyses, uh, say this is how well your diet matches with the Mediterranean diet or with the OMS diet or anything else, to be able to pass that information back to people would be of interest to them. Uh, we do a lot of studies do try to do that to try to pass that kind of direct evidence back to people rather than simply saying we published it. Some Somewhere. Here's the link. Go read it if you want. To give people back their information is something that a lot of studies try to do, uh, and so it's something we're definitely hoping to do in the register. Well, I'm thinking obviously in a fairly biased perspective here, but say if somebody was accidentally closely following the Overcoming MS program, but they'd never actually heard of the organization, mm -hmm. we were able to say, actually, do you realize what you're doing is, is pretty much Overcoming MS? There's a really active community out there. It's more than just diet. It's about support. It's, you know, and, and community and well-being togetherness i think that's a really positive thing that come back out of the research to the people actually involved um, and yeah. you know that would, uh, that would be and, sorry. 
Yeah, it would be. I mean, as you say, there are a lot of resources and, and, and things available within the OMS community. Also, of course, as you'd be well aware, the Overcoming MS program has more to it than just the diet. I mean, that is a, a big part, but there's, you know, the physical activity, the, the, the stress reduction through meditation, taking the right supplements and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, but again, something we found with people with MS is they are a very savvy and active population in terms of people they first have a clinical demyelinating event, as we call it. That's the first clinical symptom that may lead to your MS. Uh, and uh, the first thing they do is go on Google and say, what can I do to improve my, what lifestyle can I follow? Uh, so we find actually a lot of people with MS uh, are following diets uh, modification of various kinds. And what we want to do with our data is just to make sure that what they follow uh, is best for them and, uh, and, and best for the outcomes that they want to realize. Unfortunately, Personally as well, uh, Steve, they're always very keen to help with research too. <laughs> yeah. So they, they well, no, yeah, it's a great, it's, uh, and that's the great thing that uh, we are just permanently indebted to. Uh, because again, all the work that we do, we want it to benefit MS, uh, people with MS, uh, and, but we are permanently indebted to you for providing the data that we do to do that. Um, this is actually a really good question. I think it, uh, it's, it's really worth just picking apart slightly. So when you say that someone's measuring quality of life, so call it, you know, and, and lots of those studies will now have quality of life as one of the outcome measures. Is it largely self-reported by the person with MS? Or is there some statistical analysis? How, how, do, how, are, we, how are we scoring that? What's the significance of it? You know, how reproducible is it? I think that's really a really, really good question that someone's asked. Uh, so quality of life, unlike, say, your disability or your relapse rate, which are very objective parameters that a neurologist can do, quality of life is inherently subjective. Actually, so are fatigue and depression when we do those measurements. Those are inherently subjective. But quality of life particularly so, there is no objective measure. Like if we do a survey uh, to assess somebody's depression risk, we can assess them clinically to see are you actually depressed. By a psychiatrist or someone but there is no similar objective measure for quality of life and so there's a very comprehensive measure called the ms call 54 which is 54 questions to assess quality of life it gives you two broad composite scores of your overall physical quality of life and your mental quality of life and then a bunch of subdomains this has been uh not validated because there's nothing to validate against per se in terms of what is good quality of life uh, but it has been strongly validated in the ways you'd expect with other things like disability and fatigue and relapse and so on. Um, and it is thus very widely used. We use it in the, in the uh, uh, Hollison study. It's used in a number of other studies as well. Uh, it, it is subjective, but it does use a schedule of, of those 54 questions, which is then scored as per an algorithm to give the scores that we then use for analyses. Yeah, and I, th I think that's, that's really important to say. It's not just a, on a scale of one to 10, how great mm -hmm. these quality of life is. It's actually a very, very detailed, I remember filling it out once actually, and it's quite the, it's quite the task to, yeah. to fill the, um, the 54 answers. So yeah, thank you, Steve. That was, that was really, really clear. Um, I've got a, well, I've got some really nice feedback to say that thank you, Steve. It's been a, a fascinating webinar and will the slides be available to look at after the webinar is finished? Yeah, I should think so. Fantastic. That's, that's the answer we were hoping for. Um, mm -hmm. Have you any information surrounding the IMSMS, the International Microbiome Study, and where it's at currently? So the, this was one through the, the Rowling Clinic in the UK where people were donating uh, stool samples and things. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you aware of any of that research or is that part of what you're going to be doing in the future? Or I would love to have that data. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to get stool samples from people. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's as hard as it is to get a blood sample from somebody, it's harder to get stool samples. It's actually why it's very, uh, that's why colorectal cancer is such a problem, because you could actually do, uh, get a very good idea of your five and 10 year colorectal cancer risk if you do a fecal blood sample, uh, a fecal sample, you know, at, at interval. But nobody wants to touch poop, it's, ew, it's gross, icky. And as a consequence, a lot of people unfortunately die of colorectal cancer because they don't have appropriate screening. But that is a hard measure to get. Uh, we definitely will look at liaising with the with that study uh, to see if there's overlap between our participants and those participants. Uh, but uh, that's not data that we have presently. But it would, as I again, as I said, microbiome, gut microbiome is a potential mechanism by which diet would modulate uh, disease. So if we did find a strong association of diet quality with outcomes, we would look to substantiate it by assessing the mechanisms, including gut microbiome. And I think that that really brings me on to probably my, my last question for you. I'll be glad to hear, Steve. Where do you think the research is going to go? 
over the next five to 10 years? What, what, where's the big hope, the big areas that we should be looking into? And, and what do you think? I know this is a maybe an unfair question, but what do you what do you think we're going to be saying about lifestyles rule and MS? You know, five years say from now. Um, I hope that there will be more uh, prospective studies like we we've done in Holosome and what we're proposing to do with the UKMS Register that get a detailed measure of things like diet, but also things like physical activity and supplement use and so on, so that we can get the kind of high level prospective evidence to say whether these things are potentially causally related. And so again, uh, we've got the Australian study that I mentioned. Uh, the NARCOM study will potentially look at some prospective studies uh, and, uh, and, and also the collaboration between all of these investigators uh, to try to pool their data sets to get a better idea of, of, of whether these associations are genuine. And in terms of where I see the uh, evidence going, or the, I, I should hope uh, at this point, uh, in five or ten years, I hope that it's fairly well solidly established that smoking is the single greatest thing that people, stopping smoking, I should say, is the single greatest modifiable lifestyle factor that any people can do to reduce their MS risk and to, to reduce their MS progression risk. Um, in terms of other things like uh, physical activity, uh, I hope that that is solidly uh, indicated as something that people know that they can do to potentially benefit their disease. Uh, and I hope in five or ten years, uh, partly through our own work, but also others, that people have a much greater idea of whether and how diet can potentially modify their disease. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. But I think it probably in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, I'll just continue to do what I'm doing and eating as well as I can, just, just in yeah. case. Um, the, the evidence is there definitely that if you follow a good diet, it will improve your heart health and your cardio in your general long-term uh, longevity. Uh, but the thing we just want to make sure is that the evidence is also there for their MS because it may be that uh, that it doesn't, that you, that you don't need to invest your effort to modify a diet and instead you can focus on other aspects of lifestyle like physical activity or not smoking or supplements or so on. But if we can show that diet is something that you can modify to improve your disease, then that is a very powerful thing because we all eat, we all eat multiple times a day and it's a relatively simple thing to modulate. It's easier to follow a good diet is than to quit smoking as, uh, as a smoker will tell you. Uh, and uh, so if we can tell them this is a point of intervention that you can use to improve your MS, then that'll be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's probably just but just to sum up and, and to point people in a, in a direction to perhaps give them some positivity and a bit of hope coming into the festive uh, period. There's actually been a study just recently, editorial just recently published in Neurology, which is the, the American Association of Neurology, of a very well-respected journal, regarding, mm -hmm. in a sense, the headline there being there is sufficient evidence now to recommend diet quality for people with MS. So I think this is now, I, I, well, while Steve is completely right and, and I agree with him completely and I'm really excited about where this is going to go, I think if you're looking to live as well and healthy as you, as you possibly can with MS, then diet's a big part of that and uh, a really, really essential part of the algorithm. Um, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today all the way from Australia and giving up your Friday evening. Um, mm -hmm. All it remains for me to do today um, is to is to thank you on behalf of all our audience and to wish you a very happy holiday season and for everyone to have a very happy new year and let's see where 2023 takes us at, at overcoming MS. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, and thank you. I hope this has been of interest to people. Absolutely, it's fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>